please welcome Sebastian. Thank you very much. Um, I am very excited to be here because this is my first PyCon Poland ever. Um, for some reason, I never had a chance to attend it. Um, although I've been to some other Python conferences. Uh, actually, this talk, uh, the, the first version of this talk, was my first ever talk I gave at the Python conference, and that was at EuroPython six years ago. And since that was my first talk, I, make, uh, I made a lot of stupid mistakes, like I used Python 2 in my examples instead of Python 3. Um, yeah, so many things have changed during those six years. Uh, Python 2 is no longer a thing. Uh, we have new Python interpreters. We have some interesting initiatives aiming at speeding up Python code. But one thing has not changed. Whenever there is an internet discussion and two topics come up together, Python and performance, there is always someone saying, why do you use Python? Python is slow. Python is not slow. Python is slower than some other languages, and quite often that's fine. I mean, Python was not optimized for the, uh, for the runtime speed. Python was optimized for the development speed. And honestly, comparing the number of people writing code in WebAssembly or in assembly with Python developers, I think it was a good decision. But why is Python slower? So one of the reasons that makes Python slower is also one of the reasons that it's so easy to use. Python is a dynamic language. Um, we've, and that combined with weekly typing means that we can use the famous duck typing and we don't have to worry too much about the types of our variables. So nothing stops you from randomly reassigning variables throughout your, throughout your code. Okay, technically, your sanity should stop you from assigning a variable to a string, then to an int, to a list, and pandas data frame, but you can do this. And the interpreter has no way to know in advance what's the type of a given variable. So it can't do any of those optimizations that other statically typed languages could do. For him, your variables are always a mystery. Sure, you declared a string, but What's it gonna be 500 lines of code later? Still a string? Who knows? So the thrill of being a C Python inter interpreter must be crazy. If you're interested in a more technical deep dive into why Python is slower than some other languages, there is this great talk from Anthony Show. Uh, it's called Why Python is Slow. And if you're interested, you can find it on YouTube. So what can we do about that? Look, I probably don't have to tell this in a room full of uh, developers, but I work with various companies. And I can't believe that some of them will pay a ridiculous amount of money to their developers only to make them work on some laptop that was just lying around. <laughs> Look, if this is your computer, then I'm sorry to break it to you, but Python is not your bottleneck. And even if you're hopefully not running your programs on a potato, if you want to run some large computation, just rent a server in a cloud. I did a quick check, and for, where is my, yeah. For 54 bucks per hour, you get a machine with six terabytes of memory. And even if you don't need a ludicrous amount of memory, and let's say 128 gigabytes is enough, that's like one dollar per hour. And we're still talking about quite expensive cloud provider and on-demand pricing, so you can probably get much better offers. So instead of wasting a day trying to some, come up with some crazy algorithms to do your computations in chunks, why don't you just rent a server for a few bucks, run your computation, and just be done with it in, in a moment? You can use a different interpreter. Um, when I say Python, I actually mean C Python, but there are other implementations out there. And I know this is an advice that everyone gives, but a few people take. But the ecosystem of Python interpreters is constantly evolving. PyPy is now much more compatible with C Python code than it was six years ago. Uh, if you have some code that runs a lot of math operations in a loop, 
PyPy will probably make your code run a few times faster. And even though it won't improve the speed of, let's say, your C extensions, at least you can run them, which was a major concern a few years ago. And of course, there are other interpreters. We have uh, Python developed by Anaconda, we have Cinder used by Instagram, we have PyGeon, Graal Python, and so on. One thing that makes Python so great and so popular in the data science community is that Python is a perfect glue code language. It means that you can use Python to orchestrate some libraries that are written in much faster languages. So you can use NumPy that has functions, data structures and functions that are much more efficient for working with numbers. Or you can use Numba, which has a just-in-time compiler that you can apply with just a single, just a simple decorator. And then again, you will get some really nice speed improvements on loops and math operations. Yet another way to squeeze those few percent of speed up with almost no cost is to upgrade your Python version. With each new release, various parts of code gets improved. So if you suddenly jump from Python 3.6 to 3.11, it might turn out that your code is much faster. And even though switching between, let's say, Python 3.10 and 3.11 is not as problematic as switching from Python 2 to Python 3, um, you will still need to have a good test suite to make sure that everything works. But if you do have a good test suite, then upgrading your Python is basically a free speed up improvement. And finally, you can write faster Python code by using better algorithms and data structures. Um, that's an advice that applies pretty much to any programming language. Let me show you an example. So let's say I want to compute the sum of powers for the first one million numbers. So I can declare a total variable, then write a for loop where I will be adding the numbers uh, to my total variable, and at the end I just print my total variable. Now I want to check how long it takes to run this function. I can use IPython and two of its magic commands. So here we have run, that will run my script, and here we have time, that will print me the, how long it took to execute it. This method of measurement is far from perfect, and in the later examples I will show you something more reliable. But this is a simple example, and I just want to have the most simple way to give me some number. So please bear with me. And if you have no idea what IPython is, IPython is a um, better interactive shell for Python. I gave a talk about it three years ago, so if you're interested, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, but back to our example. So I'm running this code, and I can see that it takes 72 milliseconds. Um, I'm using the wall time, which means that I start the timer, run my code, stop the timer, and print the difference. Nothing too fancy, but it gives me a number. Obviously, there is a lot of things to improve here, so let's start small by getting rid of the global variable. So we got rid of the global variable, and now we are down from 72 milliseconds to 63. So that's like a decent 15% of speed improvement by simply eliminating the need to modify the global variable. Global variables not only make your code harder to read and reason about because you have to figure out where they are defined and what other code could modify them. As you can see, they also make your code slower to run because it takes time to, let, to look them up. But we can do better. So let's use the built-in sum function to actually add the numbers. And to make this work, we'll have to switch from a for loop to list comprehension. Cool. So our code is now much, much simpler, and we are down to 59 milliseconds, which is another few percent of speed improvement. We can do one more improvement at this point. We can replace the list comprehension with a generator expression. And to do that, we just remove this square bracket here, and now our code is slower. Is it, is it bad? Well, it depends. Optimization is often a trade-off between speed and memory usage. Generator expression has this advantage over the list comprehension that it uses much less memory 
because it does the computation only when it's needed. List comprehension will generate the whole list at once, and it will use much more memory. So if you have a very large list, you might actually want to use a code that is a bit slower, but won't eat all your RAM. We can actually check this with IPython and the memory profiler extension. So here we can see that the least comprehension version will increase our memory usage by around 50 megabytes, and the generator expression has almost no impact on the memory usage. So as I said, optimization is often a trade-off between speed and memory usage. Alternatively, if we can't turn our function into a nice list comprehension combined with a built-in function, there is another trick that we can use. There is a library called Numba that is basically a JIT compiler packed as a Python package. So we can install it, add a declarator, and voila, we cut our execution time by half with literally two lines of a no-brainer no code. Of course, Numba is not magic. Um, it will work for functions that are using loops and math inside. So if you apply it to some other functions, you might not get such a nice speed improvement. But still, it's very cheap to use, so it's nice to give it a try. But we can do even better. So let's go back to our example with the list comprehension. Python lists are heterogeneous which means that you can store different types of values together. But our example is operating on numbers, and there is a library that is much faster with working with numbers, and it's called NumPy. So NumPy is packed with functions and data structures optimized for working with numbers. So let's try to take advantage of that. So we can create an array of integers, and then we can call the power and sum functions from the NumPy library. And if we try to run it, we will improve our execution time by two more milliseconds compared to the least comprehension. Okay, well, that's not a lot. It's almost like switching to NumPy doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, turns out the problem is not with NumPy. Problem is with my poor benchmarking methodology. If I run the benchmarks the second time, I can see that it now takes 10 milliseconds to execute this code. That's because my benchmarks are also measuring the time to run the import statement. And the second time we run it, the import statement is much faster. So that's why I said that this benchmarking methodology is terrible. We'll switch to something better in a moment. But just to sum up my example, as you can see, we got down from 72 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. That's a pretty decent improvement. But more important, we learned some things on the way. So we replace the global variable with a local one, which not only makes your code faster, but also easier to reason about. We switch to using the built-in sum function instead of reinventing the wheel. You can find a lot of optimized functions in the standard library, especially in modules like iter tools or collections. We used a list comprehension instead of a for loop, which is a much more idiomatic way for creating lists. And if you're more concerned about the memory usage than the speed, you can use the generator expression instead. And finally, we reach out for NumPy, which gives you Python bindings for functions and data structures implemented in languages like C or Fortran. So you can keep writing your code in Python, but at the same time, take advantage of those very fast languages running under the hood. And we also saw how you can use a JIT compiler like Numba, where with just two lines of code, we could get a really nice speed up on some functions. And by the way, can we make those examples better? Anyone? we could change those uh, operators that would make it slightly better. Any other takes? Exactly. <laughs> so you can use a formula to calculate the sum of the next natural numbers. 
And translating this formula to Python, um, we end up with this function. And by benchmarking this code, we can see that we got down to like 300 microseconds, which is around 30 times faster than the 10 milliseconds we got from NumPy. And I'm pretty sure that still a lot of the time we see here comes from the overhead of creating a function, calling it, assigning it to a variable, printing it, and so on. So fantastic, but the answer is wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, Python is not very good with floating point arithmetics. So um, if, if we try to cast the results to int, we get this weird 32 at the end. Um, we could use decimals to make sure that the precision is better, but we know that our um, division will return an integer. So for the final and correct results, uh, we simply need to make sure that the, we are doing the inter integer division here with like two slashes, and then the benchmarks are still more or less the same, around 400 microseconds. So what we just saw was the source code optimization. That is, making your programs in a way that they will run faster, hopefully without sacrificing readability. So for the rest of this talk, I want to show you some more examples of two or more ways of how to achieve the same results for some common operations. And then we're gonna run some benchmarks and I will try to explain why one way might be better than the other. You can find the code examples at this URL. I will also show it at the end, so no need to take pictures. Um, so here's the setup that I'm using. Um, I have run the benchmarks on Python 3.10.4, which was the latest stable release when I was preparing the slides in the first place. Um, I set the Python don't write bytecode environment variable, so I don't accidentally cache any, um, any bytecode between the runs. And for the, actual for the actual timing of my code, I will use a fairly standard and simple way of running time it module from the terminal. So here is how, how it works. The green part tells Python, run me the time it module. Then the red part says, run this code, but don't in include it in the benchmarks. So this is where I will usually import some statements or set some initial variables. That way, um, we won't have the issue that we have with NumPy where the import statement was taking most of the benchmark. And then finally we have the yellow, which is the function that we, we actually want to benchmark. And then, not that it matters much, but the benchmark were run on this laptop, which is a MacBook from 2021, 16 gigs of RAM, 10 CPU, and 16 GPU cores. And it doesn't really matter what laptop I'm using, because even with the same setup, um, you would probably get completely different numbers, and that is fine. I mean, the exact numbers don't matter. If I run the benchmarks a couple of times, sometimes they will be slightly slower, sometimes they will be slightly faster. It depends on like CPU spikes from other processors. But what won't change is that my slower examples will stay slower than my faster examples, and that's the important part of this presentation. Okay, let's say you want to do some action, but you are not sure if it will work. There are two common patterns that you can approach this in your code. You can explicitly check what you're trying to do is possible and do this. So let's say you're trying to read the content of a file, but maybe the file doesn't exist, so you first check, does the file exist? If yes, then open and read it. But even if the file exists, maybe you don't have uh, access to read it, so you add another check. And then the number of checks that you have to write will grow, but you still have no guarantee that some unexpected behavior won't prevent you from reading this file. For example, you might have the race condition and the file was deleted after the first if check. So there is a different approach where you just try to do the action and in case something goes wrong, you just wrap your code in a try accept block. So let's see which one of those approaches is faster. Um, let's use a simpler example. Um, let's say I have a base class that might or might not have some attributes set. And then I make, make a subclass and I want to access the attributes. But if the attribute is my, in my base class is not set, then my code will fail. So I can either check if my object foo has the attribute hel hello before accessing it, 
or I can try to access the attribute and catch the attribute, attribute error here in case the attribute is not there. So in other words, I can ask for permission to access an attribute or I can ask for forgiveness after accessing a non-existing attribute. And if we run our benchmarks, we can see that asking for permission is around 15% slower than asking for forgiveness. Slightly slower, not some crazy amount. But what if our class has more than one attribute that we need to check, and still one of those attributes might be missing? So this time I'm using a class with three attributes, and then we do three if has other checks, or we still use one try except block. And if we run the benchmarks again, we can see that now the difference between both code examples starts to be a bit more prominent. Now asking for permission is around 80% slower. So does it mean that asking for forgiveness is always a better idea? Well, let's see what happens if the attribute is actually missing. So here I commented out one of the attributes and the rest of the code stays the same. And if I run my benchmarks one more time, I can see a complete opposite of what happened before. Now, asking for forgiveness is almost four times as slow as asking for permission. So the tables have turned because handling exceptions take time. So a good rule of thumb is to ask yourself, is it more likely that my code will throw an exception than won't? So if the answer is yes, I will probably get an exception and you can predict what might go wrong, then an if statement is a good idea. It will be faster than handling exceptions and it will much better show the intention of your code. But if you find yourself putting a ton of if statements just to catch some errors that happens once in a while and on top of that your code failed twice already because you forgot to check some corner case, then maybe it's better to just use the ask for a forgiveness approach and wrap your code in a try accept. Let's see an example of how you can iterate over a collection of items and find the one that matches some criteria. So let's say I want to find the first number that can be divided by 42 and 43. I could use a naive approach that would start a while loop and start iterating from one, return the value if it matches the criteria that we set, otherwise we just check the next number. While there is nothing wrong with the while loop, we are manually incrementing the counter, which feels like a lot of unnecessary code. So obviously we can do better. We can use a for loop with a counter, well, technically, count function, that will keep giving us the next number until we find the one that we are looking for. And if we measure the execution time of both functions, we can see that the while loop is around 25% slower than the for loop. But more important, the for loop looks much more concise, and I like it more. But what if someone told you that Python is all about the least comprehension? That the for loops are bad and you should only use list comprehensions when dealing with lists? Let's give it a try. So here I'm checking the first 10,000 numbers if they are divisible by 42 and 43. And then I just return the first element from this list. As you can probably guess, Using list comprehension is a terrible idea. We are unnecessarily creating this whole list just to grab the first number. It might make sense to use it if we really wanted to check those 10,000 first numbers, but we just need to have the first number that matches. So what would be really cool would be some kind of lazy list comprehension. A generator. Yes. Uh, Lazy list comprehension is basically a generator expression. So we can write a generator expression that will filter our list of numbers based on the criteria and then simply grab the first element that matches using this next function here. And generator expression will do just enough computation to give us the first number. 
And if we benchmark it, it turns out that it's as fast as the for loop. So generator expressions are a great alternative to list comprehensions if you need to evaluate them lazily. They are fast, concise, and memory efficient. But if you want to check multiple conditions with some nested if statements, you could in principle wrap them in some function and then call this function inside the generator, but sometimes that's, that's an overkill. And so in this case, I prefer, I prefer to stick with an old for loop. So while we are talking about lists, let's take a look at another example. Let's say I have a list of numbers and I want to get only the odd numbers. So I can write a simple for loop that will do the job. And for filtering one million numbers, it takes around 33 milliseconds. But since we are filtering something, there is literally a function called filter in the standard library. So we can use that to simplify our code. And now our code is simpler, but it's also slower by around 50%. So instead of using the filter function, we can try to use the list comprehension since we are constructing, constructing a new list. And the list comprehension is a clear winner here. For loop is around 30% slower and filter is almost twice as slow as using the list comprehension. So in this example, we tried to use three different structures. And while the list comprehension was the fastest one, and in my opinion, the most readable one, each of the constructs that we use actually has a valid use case. So list comprehension is an obvious choice if you want to build a new list. But if you don't want to have the whole list at once, the filter function is quite useful because it actually returns an iterator. So if we look back at our example, you can see that here I am calling list on this filter just to get the same results as for the, all the other functions. And it's this list creation here that takes a lot of time. So if you need an iterator that will generate the next value only when needed, filter is a great choice. And finally, we have the for loop that some people call non-Pythonic, but there is a limited amount of if statements that you can cram inside of a list comprehension bef before it becomes unreadable. So for more complex filtering, I would just stick with a for loop. So let's cover one more example of list and then we'll switch gears to something else. How do we check if an element exists in a list? Let's say I have a list of one million numbers. Um, I want to check if a specific number exists there. Again, I can do this with a for loop, just iterate over the list, check if, my, if the current item is equal to the number I'm looking for. If yes, we return true, otherwise we return false. But we can achieve the same results using the simple in operator. It's much less code, and as you can probably guess, it's faster. So let's run some benchmarks. And I have run benchmarks for three scenarios. First, when the element exists at the beginning of a list, then for an element that exists at the end of the list, and finally, for an element that doesn't belong to the list at all. And the results are pretty consistent across the board. Um, using the for loop is around twice as slow as using the membership testing operator. Okay, now that was kind of boring. I mean, if you know the in operator, you probably won't think about writing a for loop to find an element in a list. But we are not done yet. We can do better. Instead of using a list, we can use a set. Lookup time in a list has O n time complexity. So the bigger the list, the longer it takes to do the lookup. But the average lookup time in a set is constant. And if we run the benchmarks, we can see something very interesting. For an element located at the beginning of a list, the lookup time in a list is only six times as slow as the lookup time in a set. And I'm saying only because if the element is located at the end of a list or if it doesn't exist, then the lookup time in a list is over 100,000 times slower than the lookup time in a set. That's very impressive. It would be even more impressive if I wasn't cheating. So I did not include conversion of a, a list to a set in my benchmarks. I only created the set in the setup part and the code execution uh, in my benchmark was already using that set. 
But if we're starting with a list, we have to first convert it to a set. So let's try to do that here. And then when I compare the time it takes to do a membership testing in a list versus converting a list to a set and then doing the um, membership testing, I can see a completely different picture. So doing the conversion takes twice as long as just the lookup, and that's a scenario where the element is not present or is located at the end of the list, so here. If the element is located at the beginning of a list, doing a conversion from a list to a set is around 40,000 times slower than just doing a lookup in a list. So to conclude, using for loops to perform membership testing is a terrible idea. Using the in operator is usually twice as fast. The average lookup time in a list grows as the list gets bigger, but it's constant in a set. If you already have a list, then converting it to a set just to do one membership testing doesn't really make sense. But if you have some choice between constructing a list or a set in the first place, if you choose a set, then you will get some really nice uh, spin improvements on the membership testing. And one last remark, set is not a drop in replacement for a list. For example, set is not ordered, so don't randomly change your data because some guy at the conference told you that it's gonna speed up your code by 100,000 times. There is this really nice wiki page that explains the time complexity for the most common operations in the most common Python data structures, so I highly recommend taking a look. Let's talk about creating dictionaries. So there are two ways how you can create a dictionary. One is to call the dict function, and the other is to use the literal syntax, so just write those two curly brackets. And in many cases, they are equivalent, so you might not give it much thought and assume that they both take the same amount of time. They don't. So if we measure the execution time, it turns out that using the dict function is twice as slow as using the brackets. Well, almost three times as slow. And that kind of surprised me, so I decided to dig a bit deeper and see what's going on. So I fired up the disassembler for Python, and I looked what happens when I call each of those functions. So what the this module does is that it can print the actual bytecode instructions that will be executed. And even though I usually have no idea what any of those means, I can see that the important bit is this call function that we have here. You see, nothing stops you from doing that in Python. I mean, this is stupid, but Python allows you to be stupid. So when you call dict function, Python interpreter has to check that maybe you overwrote this dict function. But if you just use the curly brackets, you are using a Python statement. There is no way to override this, so Python can directly call the corresponding bytecode instruction. That's why using the literal syntax for creating dictionaries, lists, or tuples is faster than calling the equivalent functions. And this module is a great tool uh, to see what bytecode instructions your code is generating. So if you're curious how something works, you can check it out. Let's say you want to remove duplicates from a list. So here I have a list of one million random numbers, each of them between uh, zero and uh, 100. And I can write a for loop that will go through my duplicates and append the unique numbers to some other list. And then I just return that list. I could also write a list comprehension that does the exact same thing. And if I benchmark both of those approaches, I can see that they take the same amount of time. Except that this is a terrible way to use list comprehension. I mean, list comprehensions should be used for creating new lists. But in our case, we use it for side effect of appending the current number to some external list. And the list comprehension will still create a list full of nuns that you will be discarding. So please don't do that. It's better to stick with the uh, for loop to show the intention of our code. But there is a data structure that we already talked about that by definition doesn't contain duplicates. Yes, it is a set. So we can take our list of duplicates, convert it to a set, then convert it back to a list, 
and doing that is way faster. Using a for loop is over 50 times slower than simply converting a list to a set and back to a list. There is a one caveat with this method though, sets don't preserve the insertion order. So the list that we get back from this list to set to list conversion might have a different order than the list we get from the for loop. So if you want to keep the initial order, there is a trick with dictionaries. You can create a dictionary with keys taken from a list and then convert this dictionary back to a list. I know, it looks stupid, but it works. And it's still faster. So it's around 28 times, well, using a for loop is 28 times slower than using this dictionary trick. There is a small caveat though. Um, the dictionary trick only works when the elements are hashable uh, because dictionary keys has to be hashable and hashable simply means immutable. So if you have a list of lists or a list of dictionaries where you want to remove the duplicates, uh, this trick won't work. Okay, and as a bonus exercise, I decided to run all my examples through different Python versions. And for that, I simply wrote one large shell script that runs all the commands in the terminal. And then I use pyenv to switch between Python versions. So I switch to Python 3.7, I run my benchmarks, I switch to Python 3.8, I run my benchmarks, and so on. If you're curious about pyenv, uh, I have a blog post about it. It's a really nice tool to switch between Python versions. And here we have the results. Um, yeah, that's a lot of numbers. Uh, so here on the left side, you can see the functions that I had. And on the top, you can see different Python versions. And the last column, you can see the difference between Python 3.7 and 3.11. So, and the most important improvements are in bold. So, as you can see, Python 3.11 is a clear winner here, and it improves a lot of those functions. But even for older versions, performance usually improves as you upgrade your Python version with some occasional minor degradation here and there. So what happened in Python 3.11? Well, in 2020, Mark Shannon, one of the core CPython developers, proposed that he can improve CPython by a factor of five. It would take four stages, where the first two are focusing on some general tweaks and improvements, and the last two would implement some sort of simple JIT compiler. And now Mark is working at Microsoft with Guido and some other smart people implementing those ideas. And the speed improvements in Python 3.11 are the first fruits of their labor. Mark gave a talk at EuroPython this year, um, so if you're interested in more technical details of what they are actually doing in Python 3.11, I can highly recommend this talk. And here we have the rest of my benchmarks. So you can find all the results in the benchmark results uh, folder for the GitHub, in the GitHub repository for this talk. And I wish I could show you more examples because I had a lot of fun preparing them, but I am running out of time. So whatever didn't make it to this presentation, I put it in the repository of this talk. You can find some more examples together with the benchmarks. And I also left some examples where the alternative version wasn't faster, and I tried to explain why. And this whole idea for this presentation started as a list of articles on my blog. So if you want to get more details about each of the examples I, sh I showed you today, you can check it out. I have around 10 articles and I have abandoned my blog for like two years, but I'm slowly getting back to it. There will be plenty more articles because I have a lot of ideas. So just stay tuned. Okay, um, let's jump to conclusions. Source code optimization is often the last thing you think about when you notice that you have some performance issues. And that totally makes sense. I mean, no one optimizes code base by rewriting it from scratch unless you have a very bad code base. But source code optimization is not something that you should be doing when you notice that you have performance issues. Rather, it's something that you should keep in the back of your head while you are writing the code in the first place. Being curious about which code structure is faster will lead you to understanding Python better, understanding which data structure might be better in a specific case, and sometimes even understanding what is happening under the hood of your code. Replacing a for loop with a list comprehension is an easy thing to do when you're writing the code. 
And even though it might not increase the speed of your code by a lot, let's say it only gives you 20% of speed up, if you replace a for loop, few loops here, if you use a different data structure there, if you use a building build function somewhere else, suddenly you will realize that your code is twice as fast. And last but not least, please, please, please don't sacrifice the readability of your code for some small performance gains. Sure, fast code is good, uh, fast but hard to read code is bad. Thank you very much, you can find all the links here. Thank you, that was great. Uh, great trick with uh, dictionary and uh, finding unique elements. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, uh, for likes. How did you make the code move in one of your examples? It's a feature of Keynote. <laughs> so buy a Mac. Uh, <laughs> uh, regarding permission and forgiveness, what about stop iteration exception approach? In fact, it's raising a quite expected exception. What about stop iteration exception approach? Maybe the author can elaborate. If you have, if you have a loop and you're exiting the loop by raising a stop iteration, why? Okay. Yes. For yeah, I was thinking about the for loop. I was wondering why you wouldn't like break out of a for loop or return. Um, honestly, I I don't, I don't know. It's just another pattern that I I haven't thought about. But I will be curious about testing it out. All right. Uh, Another question, uh, what about using bit operators for integer-related computations in Python? Is it worth in terms of ex execution time? Uh, that's another thing that I have never thought about that, but sounds very interesting, so I would probably add it to the list of topics I want to test out. Alrighty, I think we're out of questions. Thank you again. Uh,